Thank you for joining Effortless Attraction. My name is Evelyn McAleer. I'm the author of A Life You Want, Effortless and The Woman's Journey. I'm a life coach, business mentor and inspirational speaker. And my greatest value is making a difference in people's lives. So I hope through these podcasts, I can make a difference to your life. Today's show was sponsored by Skytask Aerial Imaging, cinematic drone imaging for TV production and business promotion. Visit skytaskarealimaging.co.uk. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, whoever gets to listen to this wonderful podcast. Today, I am joined by Kevin Cassidy. Now, buckle up for this introduction. Kevin is a stuntman and he's been making movies that makes the hearts beat all that faster from 2005. So he appeared in his first feature film, The Longest Yard, Adam Sandler's remake, Sons of Anarchy, my all-time favourite on Netflix. Along with that, he's also worked with Rihanna, Britney Spears, Justin Bieber, uh, Angelina Jolie. He has written a wonderful book, Falling Down to Find Myself. He is a business owner of Ninja Warrior, and he's a father and a husband. Kevin, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me in that very warm introduction. A lot to live up to there now. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, there's so much that I could talk about. I'm just after finishing your book. And I have to say, I have loved the layout of it. I have loved the message in it. I'm a life coach, a motivational speaker myself. And I have resonated with so many parts of that book. I've resonated with your story. I've resonated with your mother. <laughs> and <laughs> I felt her pain. I felt your pain. And it wasn't pain, painless. You've never come through anything as a victim. That's one thing I can definitely point out. Can I just ask for anyone that's listening in here too, could you take us through a wee bit of your journey? You sort of got life started off to a difficult start to no fault of your own. But as your mother and father would always say, you got the scenic route in life or you chose to take the scenic route in life. Yeah, that's right. I, I say in the book that uh, I was given the um, freedom to fail many, many times over from my family, which at the end of the day is a very good thing. I also had the freedom to succeed many, many times in my life. Um, but I was uh, born with a severe cleft palate uh, birth defect and a speech impediment that I throughout my youth would go to speech therapy and uh, multiple surgeries and bullying and teasing and all, all that route. So at the moment uh, I arrived in the world, I was at a little bit of an uphill uphill climb, which now looking back, I think has strengthened me and got me ahead of the curve in a lot of other ways. Uh, people are trying to find themselves nowadays. I was kind of forced to do that at a young age. And uh, in the book I'm sharing, uh, trying to be very vulnerable. Also, I had a pretty cool stunt career and movie career, trying to get people to, lack of a better word, find themselves, find their true path without going through some of the trauma that I did, try to unlock some of that without going through some of the, the heartaches. And uh, it's good to hear that you like my mom's story in that, because a lot of people, when they read the book, they're like, what's your mom think about this? I said, well, she, she <laughs> has assigned some NDAs, and, but we have a great relationship. Oh, I did. You know, I resonated in the book, and I, I'll get to where we can get this book, because I definitely would highly recommend it for anyone to read. I resonated in the book, in the story uh, with yourself. I, I thought now, Kevin, there's a defiance in him. I'm not <laughs> so a rebellion in him. You know, why can't you be like everybody else, Kevin? Why can't you do, do the same? I think uh, my mother used to say the same to me. I mean, why can't you just be like everybody else? Because <laughs> th there's, there's two main things and uh, two words that are predominantly used throughout this book. You said has always been on your mind. You've lived by them. And I think they are so profound for anybody in any walk of life, whatever we're doing. The what and the who. The what am I and who am I? You talk about humbleness, confidence and being humble at the same time. The benefits of that, Kevin, what it brought to your life. Yeah. And uh, I, I was actually listening to one of your podcasts with uh, Patty Moore and the uh, neural culture coach. Yes. And you guys got into many, many of these things. And I tried to talk through the screen and, and elaborate on some of them because uh, I think a lot of people are on the same kind of mission of the who versus what and I really try to break that down in the book and make it easily digestible for the younger audience and the older audience. And 
I think I say in the book, if if you want a new idea, read an old book. These we're not reinventing the wheel with this who versus what. We're just describing it in a in a more tangible, digestible way. I think now, being confident in who you are, not what you are. Again, I was blessed to had to fight that head on at a very young age and um, figure that out, which has made me very successful. It made me kind of my true self earlier, and people people gravitate towards that. People want to unlock that subtitle of the book is to you know find true happiness and that's at the end of the day that's all our goals and we want to be happy and some people that need a million dollars to be happy some people need to be with their family some people need a little bit of both and um it all comes from the inside not from the outside do you find kevin in your line of work that as you say in there that everyone's ultimate goal is to find that inner peace and happiness but do you also see perhaps in people that their underlying belief is that i'm not good enough yeah i think it's a snowball building up momentum down the hill where the more you count on your what your job title your exterior factors your good looking your athletic your any any kind of external what um it's like a drug that you're always chasing that high. It's never gonna. It's never gonna fulfill you. You're never gonna get there. You see people who are aren't confident, and I think a lot of that comes from they're early reliant on that what. And in order to to get to the who being more important, the character, uh, how your communication, how good of a friend you are, the father you are, you know, how hardworking you are, how honest you are. All those are the who's. I think. Some people need to be broken down a little bit um, mm. and just be self-reflective. If, not, if you're not going to look internally and and reflect on yourself, you're never going to grow internally. So if you keep looking for outward uh, expression for happiness, it's going to it's going to be harder for you to look inward, which at any day that's what you have to do. And I, but also I put in the book like what I was a baseball player, and a lot of my what's have pulled me through tough times, and mm. I call them. They could be a crutch. You can lean on it. I have a tough time. I lean on baseball, lean on football, lean on my athletic prowess. And that gets me through some of the tough times. But like a broken leg on a crutch, when that leg heals, you got to drop that crutch and keep going. So mm-hmm. your watch can be a crutch, but it can't be your identity. And I think a lot of people get trapped into that. And then that, at the end of the day, that sucks your confidence out because they're always looking for external reasons to be confident. Yeah, you know, and someone could look in on your life and think, wow, and what it is, wow. And I say <laughs> hats off to people that achieve what they wish to achieve towards the end of the book. And I don't want to be giving away all the book because I say <laughs> to people, get the book. It's fabulous. This <laughs> book should be a movie. Yes, towards the end, end of the book, you were sitting chatting with a guy. Question where he was able to say, in five years time, I'm going to be da 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 what do you want to do in five years time Kevin there's one thing having the dream and I talk about manifesting a lot to people it's one thing to think about it and imagine it but as you've said in the book you've got to take small steps in that direction and take action what it is that you would like to achieve from life yeah you have to have the macro and 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 the smaller things you have to know where you want to be in five years but then you also have to break down and figure out how to get there and in the book I I steal a quote from um, Lou Holtz, who's a great college football coach over here in America, and uh, win, W-I-N, what's important now. And mm-hmm. he breaks it down into, into football, what's important right now, having a good breakfast, great, and you have energy, what's important now, this second, get my workout in, get my grades, in. and all those little things culminate to the, the larger goal, um, but you have to have both. You have to know where you want to go, know how to get there, and then have the, the work ethic and the desire to do it. And I think if you're being, if you've defined who you are, you're confident in that, that's way easier. Even when I was making a lot of money working on the biggest adventure, the biggest Marvel movies in the world, I knew that I could leave that all behind in a snap without even thinking twice about it because it was affecting you know, my family life, things that were more important, things I wanted to focus on. I've never taken anything I've done, any what, even the high end, you know, performer on some of the biggest movies in the world and really put my stock into that. And that is allowed me to quit that career, move, be closer to my family, take a huge pay cut and be way happier at the end of the day. So, mm. I mean, it's hard to do, but again, I think I was lucky by having all those struggles earlier in life that I never really cared much about what I was because it changed every 10 minutes. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I was forced to, to look in and, and find my who. And I, I want to share that message. 
and you definitely had a colorful life you know there's a <laughs> say when the show is called effortless attraction the first thing that attracted me to you was your name kevin cassidy and i say <laughs> i know you don't know too much about your irish ancestry but i definitely think it's a good strong county tyrone name here too so that attracted me first of all then when i read about I, the keys to happiness inner peace i thought yes and then when I saw all the experiences, like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I love people with color. I love people that have had adventure and excitement. As Kevin said, that he was born with a, a cleft palate and a probably more severe than what the normal cases of it would have been. And going through having to learn how to speak and then the next surgery would come along and then having to learn how to re-speak and then going through school without teeth and then getting a few teeth and being called rat boy. I have to say your sense of humor has prevailed in that book. You never came through as a victim. But I do want to ask this question too, because it came up later on in life. There was one particular incident with a coach where everything <laughs> kind of went every way, but the right way and the anger, as you called it, like a volcano eruption. You just lost control of everything. Do you find that communication, Kevin, some road along the line played a part? Perhaps your parents didn't quite understand you. They had this other assumption that you were into drugs and stayed in cars when you were thinking, where are they getting this from? There's no point in talking to them because they're not going to get it anyway. And I thought, did that come through where an inability perhaps to communicate and then it just was all compacted down and then the explosion happened? Yeah, I think communication is always key, but a lot of that, like your guest Patty said, a lot of it is with ego. That that coach had a huge ego, and I was mm -hmm. young and had an ego and it was a little brass. That experience is, I think, mostly ego based. But the interactions with my parents were, like I say in the book, I, I never felt like I got the benefit of the doubt. I was always default the wrong in the wrong and everything, and I was mm -hmm. pretty centered in my, you know, what was right and what was wrong, and just because you were a teacher or someone you could be wrong too and when I was wrong I put myself out there but when other people are wrong I wanted that for them too and then generationally like my parents were raised in New York City they their parents grew up in the depression my grandfather was a police officer my grandmother didn't work so they grew up with different kind of emotions or lack thereof emotions in their family and that gets handed down and we never really hugged much as a family and we're kind of the the tough that New could Yorker. be the Irishness coming through in them. <laughs> well, and my mom and my mom's Italian, so the Irish Italian combination is is uh, that's probably where the volcano came from. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. That's the answer. <laughs> that one sorted. That's our question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the kid, you, know, you you bury a lot and you try to get through, and I use humor, but it's still there. You gotta let it go. You gotta have that release, and if you don't let it release in communication or have a shoulder to cry on. And especially for me, I'm a big, you know, I'm a six foot three, 230 pound kind of alpha male guy. And uh, when it releases after it's been pent up, it's, uh, it's not fun for anybody around. So I've done a mm -hmm. lot better job of, of making sure those things are released and out in the open. And it's easier as you're an adult, you're a little more mature. You, you care less what people think. You value that in your relationships and, and marriage and friends and coworkers and, I wouldn't take some big movie jobs if I knew the boss was someone who was going to be a yeller or a big ego. I'm like, I, I don't want that job. I'll, I'll take another job. I'll, I'll, I'll take less money and do something different. So I was always yeah. um, confident that I would always, I had enough tools in my toolbox. I would, I'd always put food on the table. I'll figure it out. Made life harder at some points, but at the end of the day, it made me where I want to be. Mm. You talked quite a bit about serendipity there, or as luck would have it, you know, in, in, in different circumstances. And I also then read the part of the book where your wife and yourself are listening to a radio interview and a lady talked about her tiredness and she was tired with work, she was tired with the kids, she was tired with this. And no matter how much the other gentleman, the host talked about change, that her focus was still on being tired. And absolutely 100% what we put our attention on where the air energy flows and it only increases um, to that. So 
do you believe subconsciously in yourself that girl was meant to be there that day at the longest yard to vouch for you your friend was meant to give you the call and say come on down this the for and try out for the stunt man role you know and all you, you had great friends and and people came into your life at the right time even if it looked wrong even if there was a big <laughs> lesson that everything sort of divinely orchestrated to take your life a certain direction i think it's 50 50 you can i think you put enough out there that you have enough options enough you have enough friends someone's gonna have an opportunity for you when i was homeless living on my couch in my in baltimore that guy was a good friend of mine he opened up his door to me because i'm a good person my my who is strong and i'm kind and you know i helped with his kids and he gave me a place to sleep when i didn't have you know didn't have money or means to, you know, to have a home or a place of my own and i think the more you put yourself out there in that positive way and surround yourself with positive people and do positive interactions and that network grows and at the end of the day, if it's a big enough network, you, it'd be weird not to fall into those kind of places because you built so many nets around you to fall into. Mm. So if I didn't have many friends and those things happen, you'd be like, well, that's it's really, really lucky. But I know throughout my my time and my connections and my you know, valuable friendships and every time I do something, I'm just, you know, all heart forward and everyone and I, I gravitate to other people who are the same way. Like my friend in Baltimore, my friend I play slam ball with, who I slept on his couch. And then the lady in the slam ball who got me into the longest shower because she vouched for my character. And you mm-hmm. get enough, you interact with a lot of people in life and you don't yeah. you don't know who's going to be, oh, if this guy ever crossed my path, I, I got his back, whatever it takes. So you plant enough seeds with that. And I think it's only a matter of time before they start, you know, you know yeah. blossoming. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember just reading that one minute you're signing autographs, the next your yeah. couch, so, you know, you're on your friend's couch. Yeah. yeah. And as you say, but befitting the title, falling down to find myself. Yeah. So let's get to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> you can put Evelyn McAleer now to the list of people you've interacted with in your <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, let's put some Hollywood sparkle here. Highlights of Hollywood Stuntman. Uh, well, the, the first movie I did, like you pointed out, was The Longest Shard with Adam Sandler and Burt Reynolds and Chris Rock and all these great guys. And I was pretty much spoiled by that being my first movie because everyone was so nice. No one had an ego. The director was very nice. He would have dinner with you. No one was a yeller. It was a, the best movie set you could possibly be on. It spoiled me for other movie sets, but... For this time, it was it was unbelievable. And I'll tell you a quick story of my first uh, stunt. If you want to hear, I think I wrote it in the book. But um, oh, sure, I love yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, I was the uh, the free safety on the inmate teams. So I was in out of Sandler's team and uh, and all the jailhouse stuff. And there's a scene in the movie where we had our first practice, our first let out of the jail cell to actually practice football. And Adam Sandler's under the center. He calls hike. The ball goes under his legs. He turns around to retrieve it. When he turns back around to look at the team, everyone's just fighting everybody. Everyone's beating each other up. We all have football helmets on and pads, and everyone's going wild because, you know, we're, we just got out of jail, so we're having a good time. The stunt coordinator said, okay, you guys fight each other. The linebackers fight the, you know, everyone who's you're standing next to. You. When Adam turns around, just wrestle each other, throw each other down, and mix it up, and, and we'll see what we like on the cameras and, and go back and shoot it again. And I was kind of in center field by myself, not really next to anybody. So I asked, I said, hey, I'm out here. I don't want to be, you know, on camera, not doing anything. Where should I go? He pointed out, go over there with these two guys and mix it up with them. And now at this point, we're in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We're all living in the same hotel together. We're going out having beers. Uh, we're all ex-athletes and 25 years old. So we're all good friends. So I'm running over there to mix it up with these two guys. And at the last second, I said, you know what? I'm going to drop kick them. I jumped up and kicked them both in the chest. And they go down. And we're wrestling on the ground. And all of a sudden, the whistle blows. Cut, cut, cut. And we're talking about it. And the director and Adam Sandler and all the guys go behind the tent to watch the playback of a different camera angle. And the whole tent goes, oh, who drop kicked somebody? And I was like, oh, man, I'm going to get fired in my first movie. I shouldn't have done that. I'm trying to hide behind my buddy, but it's literally on film. They're going to find out that it's me. So I raised my hand. I said, I'm sorry. I got a little excited. I didn't mean to do it. Adam Sandler goes, that was awesome. Can you do it again? I said, absolutely. I can do it again. 
And uh, that was my first bitch. And then the director came to me later on in the movie and asked me to do that same big double drop kick in the uh, in the final game and the kickoff and uh, made the trailer of the movie. And it was a pretty cool, iconic shot, all because uh, I thought I'd be funny and then I thought I got fired and it was a great thing. Kind of microcosm of my life, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it was like replaying, like be reborn, because whenever you were younger, you never got those opportunities because you were they had to look after you delicate because of all the yeah. operations. So you never got all yeah. those opportunities to rough and tumble. And yeah. every boy's dream to be out there drop kicking somebody and getting head for it. <laughs> That's right. Living the dream. Yeah, it really was. It was awesome. It was a great time. How long did Hollywood last for you then? So about 17, almost 18 years. Um I did the longest yard and then I said, hey, I'll stay in LA and, and ride this wave as long as I can do it before I started real life. And then I did another football movie called The Gridiron Gang with The Rock. And I started doing especially sports and football, baseball, and I uh, did uh, motion capture for a lot of video games like NFL Madden and Gears of War and Halo, all the motion capture stuff. So I kind of was specialized in the sport world. And then I took a long time to train, learn how to do fights and car driving and fire and falls, and then transition into the into the real, real big time stunt world. And um, that transition could have went either way. I stuck my neck out enough, and met there's a stuntman softball league which I played in, a stuntman golf tournament. You kind of immerse yourself in the culture in LA and the stunt community. It's all word of mouth. There's no agents, no managers, no auditions. You just all fill the job at word of mouth and. Again, I'm my who comes to my rescue. I'm a nice guy. I'm athletic. I work hard. It's not complicated. People want want to hire me, and I do a yeah. good job. I show up on time, and before you know it, uh, 17 years later, I'm in London and Prague working on Spider-Man: Far From Home. I'm getting a lot of money. I'm living in a nice apartment. They're flying me first class over to Europe, and I look down and I have a two-year-old and a, and a six-month-old baby at home, and I didn't see them for four months. I flew home for a birthday party. Flew back. And I you know, realized uh, this is a young man's game. My time, energy, better spent at home. So I started working out plans to, to leave that world. But it was 17, almost 18 years. And I still have a lot of good connections. A lot of friends are in, in the world. So I could I could jump down and work on the movie for a week here or there um, when I want to. So I'll start doing that again when my kids get older. So I always keep, uh, keep one foot in there to play a little bit. Hey, I was thinking us growing up in the 80s, the nearest stunt man that I seen was the fall guy. On yeah, TV. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you had the Dukes of Hazards and yeah, yeah. all these and the boys, you're either a cowboy, an Indian or a stunt man. I think <laughs> most of the boys, whenever they were growing up, you have your own business now, Ninja Warrior Training Gym. Tell us a wee bit about it. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's called Ninja Nation. And uh, when I was leaving Hollywood, I had a bunch of different business plans. I wanted to do something with kids and mentoring. I've always been drawn to to mentoring and coaching. And I was a teacher in Baltimore and I always wanted to you know, go back to that. I was a baseball player by trade and I played football at a high level. And I, that's kind of my specialty, but I didn't want to get into that world because I don't know how it is over there, but in the States, if you're, if you're eight years old, nine years old, and you're really good at football, baseball or basketball or any big sport, there are sharks coming to get you. They're trying to put you on the travel team, trying to get you a scholarship, mm-hmm. having your parents pay money, promising this, promising that. And it's just, it becomes a soul sucking environment at a younger and younger age that I didn't want to be involved in at all. Mm-hmm. So in my relationships in Hollywood, I met people who are parkour athletes and free runners and ninja warriors and Red Bull skydivers, and, uh, Cirque du Soleil performers and gymnasts. So a lot of people I found I really was drawn to the people who were the what I call the X Games athletes who did motocross or skateboarding or that kind of stuff. They just had a really cool community. They always lifted each other up. They were uh, they had the it factor that I wanted to share with my kids into my business, whatever that would be and researching what the best business plan and um, P&L, profit and loss tables and all that, I found this company called Ninja Nation. I actually have my own building designs and partners and had my own business, but I found a new business that was uh, just launching that I partnered with. Uh, I opened up, I brand partnered with them um, to open up one of their locations in Charlotte. And it's a Ninja Warrior training facility it's a big 11,000 square foot playground that we do camp. So we have a competitive team. We do uh, have a development program, kind of like a gymnastics studio. 
uh, mentorship programs. And we also have birthday parties and come and play and jump in the airbag. I've done a couple of stunt classes where I taught the kids how to do, you know, different reactions and stunt falls. I'm really loving that, that business. It keeps me at home. I give my, my four-year-old a ride to preschool every morning and pick her up every afternoon. Uh, mm. I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old now. All girls, of course, because I need to be softened up more, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so living with four women, uh, oh, trying to make them happy. Is you only a, thought uh, your failure. teenage years were bad. I know. Now, <laughs> now I'm wishing I can go back to Hollywood and be out of town for three months at a time. I'm trying to yes, think I overcorrected. Yes. I'm home too much now. <laughs> it might be easier being on the in the on the football yard um, getting drop kicked <laughs> than uh, you have three years coming through teenage years. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, well, the business is going good, and I, so I just wrote the book, and I'm trying to do some mentorship program. Uh, speaking engagements lined up with new teachers actually a friend of mine is high up in the school systems here and she thought my message in my book would really be valuable to not only the kids but also the teachers teaching the kids because a lot of times they're, they're younger people who are trying to find their way and the more confident they are and the more at peace with who they are they can be a better teacher and a better role model uh, for the kids as well so I'm doing some teaching training and trying to find my uh, my path with this book and the speaking and, and mentorship and do the business and keep four women happy. So it is just, it's mm-hmm. <laughs> <you know. laughs> I definitely feel that your message, your experiences, the person that you are yourself, corporate, schools, adults, teenagers, it's the same message delivered a different way. But all those lovely experiences that you've had too um, in your life, I, I really get excited. I love hearing people's stories. Yeah. I love people that have stepped outside the comfort zone. And all them wonderful attributes that you have, you never really got too attached to anything. Yes, we do have emotional attachments, but it's like, okay, that's that done now. I'm ready to let go and I'll I'll, I'll move on here. Um, I'm hoping the book is, I I was writing it and got onto a publisher and I learned that whole world of how to publish a book and the business of it. And they were saying, you have to identify your audience, who you're writing this book for. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you have to pick one when you're writing it. So I had two different options. One was like a long form, 400 page, like novel, like character development about my mom and my dad and these experiences and really deep dive. But I really want this to be kid focused and high school and college kids and people can read it quick. It's uh, only 150 pages. So I well, wanted- it reminded me of the length of my books when I wrote them too. That's I thought it's for people. I thought if you're going away on holiday traveling, you can put it in a bag, backpack bag, easy to read. I love yep. decent sized text that I can read it yeah. too. <laughs> but something that you can pick up again and just open a page and go, ah, there it yeah. is. There it is. And you know, the show so good stories that people like to hear stories and with a good message. I'm calling it a philosophical memoir because it's a story of my life, but there's a couple of philosophical themes in there that I weave into it. So you get a lot out of it and you have a lot of fun reading it, hopefully. Yeah, well, it's an absolutely fantastic book and I would highly recommend it to anyone. It's called Falling Down to Find Myself by Kevin Cassidy. Kevin, where can people get the book? Uh, Amazon, anywhere books are sold is what uh, my publisher is telling me. So there's, uh, I have a website, uh, www.kevincass.com. A couple of fun pictures from my stunt career on there. So mm-hmm. you can get on my website. You can just go to Amazon and put in Falling Down to Find Myself. If someone from Ireland or the UK listens to the podcast, like, okay, I'd like to get that guy. Go through your website again, Kevin, to get any contact details for any speaking uh, engagements. Absolutely. Yeah, there's an uh, area on the bottom of my website you fill out. Like, and the email goes right to me. Where can we find you on social media? You're uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm starting the, in the in the stunt world no one really does a whole lot of social media it's all word of mouth so i'm learning that whole that whole game of, <laughs> well you have uh, girls coming along once you get a wee bit older I, don't I know, know social media <laughs> <laughs> i know i'm on facebook and i'm instagram but i'm not not super active on twitter I'm, I'm starting to do that now to uh i started a Substack. i write some essays i'm trying out weekly essays on Substack, and that is on my website as well find me on facebook say hi drop me a note uh love to come to ireland and and hang out with you <laughs> surely you are more than welcome i always say my house is an open house i bet they delete yeah. that from the podcast the confidence <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. More than yeah. welcome. More than welcome, Kevin. Yeah. So, yeah. Kevin, I want to say, honestly, thank you so much for your time today. And I hope we ever got an opportunity to listen to this, that you've gained some insight um, and you've benefited because I said my core value is always to make a difference in people's lives. I believe people connect to people when you reach out, say hello, energy connects to energy and just hear perhaps that we can make a difference in our own lives and the lives of others. Kevin, thank you so much. Thank you, Evelyn. Looking forward to uh, talking to you again soon. Today's show was sponsored by Skytask Aerial Imaging, cinematic drone imaging for TV production and business promotion. Visit skytaskarealimaging.co.uk.